been able to wake up on a Sunday morning after the Apple Cup and feel pride in the Washington State Cougars. Yeah! Woo! Go Cougs! And for all of you Husky fans, thank you for giving us one. We don't get them very often, but you guys were terrible this year, so helped us better, be better. Hey, so glad to be with you. Like Santal said, we are glad to be back. We were in California over Thanksgiving. Uh, my sister-in-law got proposed to, and she said yes, which was good. Um, we got to be part of a surprise for that, which was a lot of fun. We also decided we wanted to surprise our kids with our trip down to California. And so Wednesday before last, they woke up thinking they were going to go to school. And we're like, you know what? Let's just go get on an airplane and go to California. And they're like, what? And it was just, it was so much fun. And I just want to sit here today, you know, even though being in California, you know, and sitting on a beach in November and going to the more affordable Disneyland, which is called Knott's Berry Farm, and <laughs> eating in and out burgers um, all week long, those are all good things, right? But it's funny, because every time we're in California, I just get so excited to come back to Yakima. Like, this place is amazing. We live in the best city in the whole entire world. I believe that to be true. Um, and also, I mean, it's just such a fun time to be back, right? Because this is the fun season and living in the Northwest. It's winter time, right? Like, it's holiday season. We're doing holiday magic, which is an incredible thing that we get to do, partnering with DSHS uh, and, and getting Christmas gifts for the foster kids in Yakima. And if you haven't been a part of that yet, we put some uh, more little ornaments out there that have some names on them that you can, you can grab one of those and, and buy a gift for a foster kid in Yakima. And, it's, and then we have Gift to the World coming up, which is just a couple weeks ago away. So we need to be praying towards that and what God wants us to do. To do and how he wants us to participate in that. And then it's like Christmas Eve, which I'm so stoked for, right? And then it's like the new year. We're bringing a new word for the year 2022. And like, this is a fun time to be here. And so we're glad to be back. Last week we were online uh, watching as Austin preached an incredible message, did a great job uh, with that text last week. And uh, we even got to minister to some people while we were online, which was really cool. It just shows that God is moving, not just here in the building, but also with our online community. And so um, last week, Austin launched us into this new series, which is also the last series for 2021, which is kind of crazy. Uh, this series called Here I Am. And it's important for us right now, because as we are looking at this text, we're looking at these characters in our Bibles who had at least one here I am moment where God showed up to them, where God spoke to them, and they responded. And last week, uh, in looking to Abraham, you saw this response to God uh, and with incredible faith, right? As God asked almost this inconceivable thing for Abraham to do, and that was to sacrifice his one and only son. And Abraham still walked in obedience, even though believing, hopefully, that God was going to intervene, and he did, and he provided the ram so he didn't have to do that. But God loved to see the obedience of Abraham. And today we're going to continue in looking at some characters and we're going to actually see the story of Abraham's grandson whose name was Jacob. And honestly, I'm like, yeah, I get to preach about Jacob. What a great name. But then when I look through his story, it's like, you know, I'm not super proud of that, the fact that I have the same name as, as, as this guy because uh, he didn't really respond to God in great faith all the time. Sometimes he did, but I want to give you a little bit of, of his story and kind of the background before we get into maybe his here I am moment. So let's catch up a little bit in human history because if you look at our Bibles in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, it shows this, the creation story and, and the making of humanity and this, this creation that God made to have dominion over the world. And yet what we see very quickly is that humans commit folly and they commit violence and they rebel against God like at every step along the way uh, to the point that you see the first reset button that we kind of see with God and the flood, right? With Noah and the, the ark. And then, and then it even leads to another moment where the cycle then continues after that and there's more rebellion to the story of the Tower of Babel where God disperses and scatters humanity and it's kind of like God is starting over again. And so he chooses this new Adam and Eve in a sense by this man named Abram and his wife Sarai which God renames as Abraham and Sarah. We learned about their story last week. And what God promises is that the blessings that he gave to humanity in Genesis 1 and 2 have not changed that he was still on mission to give that blessing to all the nations, all the people of the world, but now it's going to be in a special way that comes through one particular family led by Abraham and Sarah. And so this uh, formed the drama of Genesis 12 through 15 uh, that traces the story of four generations that start with Abraham. And it it's all about how and if 
Abraham's family will become that faithful vehicle of God's blessing to the nations. And honestly, if you look at this whole section in Genesis, Abraham's family is no different. They just do an okay job, right? Abraham actually ends up spreading as much pain and conflict among his community as he does spreading God's blessing. So the, by the time we get to Abraham's grandson, Jacob, we have a pretty dim view of this family's success, and Jacob's not any better. And yet, this is the family with whom God has chosen to bless the nations through. So let's look at Jacob's story together, leading up to his here I am moment. So we'll go all the way to the beginning. We'll go back to the day that little Jacob was born. Okay, because Jacob from the get-go shows up with a power grab. All right, this is who Jacob is. Literally the day he was born, he was a twin. And as his older brother Esau came out of the womb, Jacob is holding on to his heel. Like, take me with you, right? Like, this is this crazy story. And if you've been in, like, the room when, when during childbirth, I think is one of the most incredible miracles that is out there. I love being in the room when both my daughters were born. But, like, Isaac and Rebecca, they probably didn't know they were having twins. Rebecca might have been like, so I seem like I'm pretty large. Um, and there's kicking on both sides of the womb. I don't know what's happening here. But they're having these twins. The Bible says that Esau came out, and he was, like, this little, like, red furry baby. And then there's... Jacob, just holding on for dear life. And it's interesting because Jacob, his name in Hebrew, Yaakov, comes from the fact that he was grabbing the Yaakov, the heel of his brother. And honestly, that heel grab is actually just a sign of the things to come for Jacob because Jacob grows up into kind of a swindler of sorts. Like he tries to take advantage of every opportunity that he can. He swindles his twin brother who was born first out, first out of his birthright. Esau came in from the fields and was like, oh, I'm so hungry. And Jacob's like, well, I'm making some soup. How about you give me your birthright and I'll give you some soup. And Esau's like, yeah, I'm so hungry. I'm gonna do that. Which I'm like, Esau, what in the world? Why would you do that? But Jacob got a birthright out of this fact that his brother was hungry. And then if you actually fast forward in the story a little bit, Another incident happens with, with Jacob's mom encouraging it, where Isaac, his dad, was on his deathbed. He's this blind man. And Jacob's mom is like, hey, you should go in while Esau is away and go steal his blessing from your father. And Jacob's like, yeah, that sounds like a good plan. So he puts on these things, like the, the furry skins, to go in and be like, hey, dad, do you want to give me your blessing? And Isaac's like, can't see. You know, he's like, is that you, Esau? And he's like, yeah, that's me. But that's not, because I'm actually Jacob. Right? And he, so he goes in to, to deceive his father, and his father gives him this blessing that was meant for Esau. And he's just like, man, Jacob is this deceptive dude. Like, this is not okay. He's a sneaky guy. And it's kind of like this new low for God's chosen family, right? Like, he'd probably seen himself as an opportunist, but in all reality, Jacob was like this blooming con artist, right? Like, this is who he is. He was always looking to take in order to be blessed. But what we already know about this family is that God had already blessed them. God had already promised them a great nation. God had already promised them a blessing that was there for Jacob and for his family. And yet the brokenness of humanity continues in this lineage. So here we have the chosen recipient of God's many gifts in Jacob. But what does this chosen blessed one do? He sets out to steal the very things that God planned on giving him in the first place. So this begins Jacob's long story of self-inflicted suffering, selfish acts that, all, that are, all are aimed at chasing down as many of God's blessings as possible. And what God allows to happen to Jacob is that he allows him to sit in the messes of his own making. And to just pause in the story here a little bit, have any of you had to sit in your own messes as you have chased down some sort of blessing? Maybe you've chased after provision. Maybe you've chased after love. Maybe you've chased after approval. Maybe at the expense of your own integrity. Maybe at the expense of your own morals or your ethics. The expense of your innocence. Jacob kept chasing after these shortcuts. And that left him with brokenness. It left him with broken relationships. It left him with things he didn't actually want. It left him with different consequences. So to go back to the story, Jacob gets this blessing from his father and he left home 
after stealing that blessing with uh, instructions from his dad to go to his mother's homeland and to find a wife, to go chase after love. And so Jacob goes off to uh, his, his mother's extended family, and that's where Jacob the swindler met his match and his uncle Laban, who ended up swindling the swindler, okay? See, Jacob went to the land of Padan Aram, and he fell in love with Laban's daughter, Rachel. And so he goes to Laban and asks for her hand in marriage, and Laban's like, okay, um, how about you work for me for seven years, and then I will give you my daughter as your wife. And so Jacob was so in love, he's like, I will love to do that. I will serve you seven years. In the, in the text, it actually says that Jacob was like, it felt like days because he loved Rachel so much. And so got to that point, he completed his seven years, he gets married to Laban's daughter, and he wakes up the next morning, and it's the wrong daughter. (laughs) And you might be thinking, how does that happen? How do you marry someone and not know that it's actually the wrong person that you want to marry? And it all comes down to veils and, and coverings and kind of the marital rituals of the wedding bed and that kind of stuff. But all in all, Jacob wakes up the next morning, and Leah is laying there next to him. And so he goes to Laban, he goes, what did you do? Like, I didn't want to marry her. She's got a wonky eye. (laughs) Literally, that's about, that's part of Leah's story. Okay, and so he goes and and, and he's like, I I was supposed to marry Rachel. And Laban's like, yeah, but you know, it's not really part of our culture to marry off the younger daughter before the older daughter. So (laughs) you get Leah. And he's like, but I'll also let you have Rachel as your wife if you work for me another, another seven years. You see, Laban's a swindler. He's like, man, this is awesome. Because by the end of it, Laban's got like 20 years of Jacob's life and productivity because Jacob loved Rachel so much. But remember, Jacob knew how to swindle as well. And so Jacob swindled the swindler who had swindled him. <laughs> Even though God had appeared to Jacob in a dream, which is where Jacob responds with that here I am statement, Right? God called them and he said, here I am. And in that dream, God promises that he's going to protect him and that he's going to prosper him because he saw how Laban had treated him for those 20 years. God was like, I got you covered. But Jacob always hedges his bets. And so Jacob, he rigs the mating season of his and Laban's flock so that his uncle's flocks diminish, and David's flocks grow big and strong, and he has all these incredible things, this livestock. See, God was going to do all these things for Jacob anyway. He was going to give this to Jacob, but Jacob had to control it. So he got his blessing after kind of this underwhelming here I am moment, right? Like last week, we talked about this incredible here I am moment of Abraham, and that was really not his story, but it was in this dream that Jacob had that God told him to go back to his native land. So what did Jacob do? In the middle of the night, he loads up his whole family and all of his possessions to sneak away from Laban without him knowing. Right? Sneaky dude. Here he is again. I'm going to take away this guy's daughters and grandchildren. We're going to leave without him even knowing. And Laban was like, uh, yeah, no, I saw that you were doing it. So Laban chases after him, and he finds him. And what was crazy is someone had stolen Laban's idols, and it was actually Rachel, was Jacob's favorite wife, right? She had stolen his idols, and Laban was like, hey, what are you doing? Like, why do you take away my kids and my grandkids? Why would you do this to me? And hey, why did you steal my idols? And Jacob's like, no, you didn't steal your idols. Uh, but really, Rachel did steal his idols, and she was sitting on him in a, in a, on a little like camel bag. And when Laban went in, it was like, hey, have you seen my idols? She's like, no, and sorry, I can't get up. I'm on my period. And he's like, ew, gross, and walked away. And so it was like this <laughs> crazy story, which, you know, turns out Rachel's a swindler and pretty sneaky herself, which is probably why Jacob loved her so much. Like, this is this, this crazy story. And Laban and Jacob, they actually mend some things in that moment, and Laban gives him his blessing, and he goes on. But here goes Jacob heading back to his homeland, but what's waiting for him there? It's his first big con, his brother Esau, and he has 400 men with him. And so Jacob starts freaking out, and he's crying out to God, and he's actually quoting these promises that God had given him, calling him out in his prayer, and this is what he says. He says, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, you who said to me, go go back to your country and your relatives, and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my one staff when I crossed this Jordan the first time, and now I'm coming back, and I have these two camps. He said, save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid that he will come and attack me, and also the mothers and their children. 
But you have said, I will surely make you prosper, and I will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. He's saying, Lord, you, you said all these things. You said you would provide. You said the whole thing about my descendants, but, but Esau is going to kill me. And God probably would have told him, no, just wait and see. Just wait and see, because everything will be okay. And if we actually fast forward in the story, you would see that everything was okay, that there was this beautiful reunion between Jacob and Esau. But guess what? Jacob didn't wait for that response from the Lord. Or he didn't live in in the truth of the promises that God had given him. He instead hedges his bets and spends the night preparing gifts for his brother. Gifts of sheep and goats and livestock. And he separates them into three different groups. And he says, okay, you guys go first. And then you guys go after him. And then you guys go after him. So that by the time Esau gets to me, he'll already have received three sets of gifts. And maybe by then he will forgive me for all that I have done. He's like, maybe then he'll have mercy on me. But God had already promised him protection. See, for some reason, Jacob won't let God give him the gifts. Jacob, for some reason, won't let God give him the blessing. He won't let him give him the protection that Jacob has always wanted. Instead, he chases after them by his own schemes. And so the night before he was going to go off to meet his brother Esau, you get this strange story where Jacob wrestles with this man. It's a mysterious man. And this is where it all shifts for Jacob. Here's what it says. It says, That night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of the Jebek. After he sent them across the stream, he sent over all of his possessions, so Jacob was left alone. And this man shows up. And it says, A man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. And then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. This is that, that, that aspect of Jacob chasing after the blessing. No, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And the man asked him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. Because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. And you see the change just in one word. Because Jacob's response is, please tell me your name. He realized something about this man that he was wrestling with. But the man replied, why do you ask my name? And then he blessed him. And says, so Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it's because I saw God face to face and yet my life was spared. Since the sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. See, Jacob realized after this whole event that this man that he had wrestled with all night was actually the angel of the Lord. When if you read through the book of Genesis, you actually see the angel of the Lord show up many different times to many different people. But this time, the angel came in a new form. The angel came as a professional wrestler. Yeah. And he picked a fight. He's like, I'm going to throw down with you, Jacob. This story is actually powerfully summarizing Jacob's whole story because here we have this chosen one, chosen from birth to receive God's blessings. But but Jacob lives and operates as if everything depends on his own scheming and on his own wisdom and on his own skills. And Jacob, as we find, is willing to sacrifice anything and everyone to get what what he wants. And so what's so powerful about this story is that God does not abandon Jacob, even though Jacob kind of deserves it, right? God doesn't just say, yeah, I'm done with you. I'm going to go choose someone else. Instead, God commits himself even more to this corrupt Jacob, and he enters into the story, and he picks a fight with the chosen one. It says if God comes down to Jacob's level and speaks his language, the language of wily maneuvering and tricky wrestling moves, it's as, if, it's as if God realizes that his chosen one is so stubborn that there's only one option left, and that is to wound him. He knocked his hip out of its socket, leaving Jacob with a limp for the rest of his life. It's this wound that finally makes Jacob receptive to the blessing that he didn't create for himself to see the reality that's right in front of him. That's as if this suffering is what finally opens him up to receiving the genuine gift of God's blessing. 
Now, there's a lot more to, to Jacob's story that I wish we could get into, like, you know, seeing the reunion with Esau after 20 years and all that kind of stuff. But this is really important because this is the story of Jacob wrestling with God. It's the real here I am moment for Jacob where everything changed. And it's this story where Jacob's name is changed from Jacob to Israel. A name that to this day still represents the land of God's chosen people. It's Israel's story. The chosen people of God, the descendants of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. It's that, that the rest of the Hebrew Bible is all about. Our Old Testament. It's as if this story is a prophetic parable anticipating the rest of Israel's long struggle and wrestle with God throughout its history, ultimately leading them to their own exile. And so it's only when God wounds Israel in the form of Jacob, but also when he wounds Israel in the form of the nation, that the faithful remnant comes out on the other side. And it's from that wounded but faithful remnant people that God raises up the ultimate Israelite in the Messiah, in Jesus, in the new covenant that can finally be the true fulfilling vehicle of God's blessing to all the nations of the world. It's Jesus Christ. Because what was the promise that we heard last week in Austin's message, in God's words to Abraham? So he was after God had provided the ram for the sacrifice that he praised Abraham for his obedience. And this is what God said. He said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring, all the nations on the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Now, Jacob was not that offspring that blessed all the nations. The nation of Israel that grew out of Jacob's 12 sons was not the blessing to all the nations. But it was through that line, the lineage that we read about in the Gospel of Matthew and in the Gospel of Luke, that Jesus the Messiah came. The offspring of Abraham. You see that in Matthew 1 in the genealogy. The offspring of Abraham that blessed all the nations of the world, even us today. So this story is telling almost in a riddle-like nutshell the story of the whole Bible. Because there's so much to ponder here. But as we conclude today, I want to give us a couple thoughts from this story that we can kind of lean into and learn from. First, let's look at the character of God in this story. God is so committed to his promises that he will chase his people with extreme mercy to get them to receive the gift of his blessing. Since the beginning of time, through Adam and Eve, to Noah, to Abraham, to Isaac, and here with Jacob, God promised, his promises remain. And while humanity, you know, we could have just walked in obedience and faithfulness and never wavered from that and everything would have been golden and perfect, we haven't. And we continue to not walk in that way. We still don't. We are disobedient. We are faithless. We are wishy-washy, right? Like, that's who we are. And yet God still chases after us with his blessing and mercy. Because that is who our God is. And the second thing is what I know some of you are maybe recognizing right now is that you are Jacob chasing after your blessing by your own strength and merit. Look at his character. He's a human who is bent on creating his own security and blessing. He's willing to neglect or shortchange other people to get what he thinks he needs. And sadly, all the while, the thing that he is chasing after is the thing that God wanted to give him all along. God is right behind you saying, the blessing is already here, won't you receive it? The blessing is already here, won't you receive it? See, I think this story should make us start to question and reevaluate the things that we are chasing after in our lives. Because I think that it is some of those things that we are chasing that are playing pivotal roles in God's wrestling match with us right now. So as we close today, I want to go back into just, Mari's going to play some 
music. But I have three questions that I want us to ponder. And possibly you you might even need to come up to the altar and, and offer some of those things that you've been chasing before the Lord. But here are the first, here are the questions, and one of them I, I led to a little bit earlier. The first question is, what's one thing that you have chased after in your life, and how have you chased after it? What are those things you have chased after? Have you chased after love? Have you chased after relationships? Have you chased after approval from other people? Have you chased after provision? Have you chased after happiness? And how have you chased after them? The second question is, has God himself already given or promised the very thing you've chased after? Has he already given that? the only true unconditional love. Provision, protection, your identity has it already been promised. I feel like this should be a thing that we, so we just got through Thanksgiving, right? Like what are those things that you can realize that God has already provided for you? And the last question is, how has God intervened in your story to help you receive his gifts? What have been those wrestling with God moments where you recognize what he has already given you? And if you haven't had them, maybe that's what's happening right now. So let's take a couple moments, just as Mari plays, and consider these things. I've realized in my own life where I've been more like Jacob where I continue to chase after the blessings things that you've already promised me and I've tried to do it on my own strength and my own merit and I've recognized even now the things the consequences the things I've had to live with because of my own selfish desires some of us are feeling the same way and recognizing that we just need to submit ourselves over to you. That your promises do ring true. That we can lean into those. And the greatest gift you've given us is your salvation. The fulfillment of the promise in Jesus Christ. Where you sent your one and only son as a sacrifice for all of us. The blessing to all the nations. If you're here today and you've never submitted yourself over to Jesus, you've never given your life to him, you've never lived in his truth and his blessing, today's the day to make that decision. The Bible says that if you believe in your heart, that Jesus came and died for you, that you confess it with your mouth that you are saved. So if you want to make that decision today, will you just raise your hand and say, that's that's me, I want to give my life to Jesus today. Yeah, see that hand? Awesome, we're with you. Anyone else? Awesome. Second question. If you're here right now and you're realizing that you've been doing this whole thing on your own strength, 
you're having that, that wrestling with God type of moment and you want to surrender over to his will for your life, will you just raise your hand as well and say, that's me. Yeah. Yeah. My hand is up. This is real. This isn't me just asking. Right? Let's pray a prayer and let's repeat this prayer together and let this be the prayer that's just saying, God, I'm all yours. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for doing my life on my own. I want to only do it for you. So repeat this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, I surrender to your will. I believe that you are my savior, that you gave your life for me, for the forgiveness of my sins, for making me new. I want to live for you. I surrender my will, my plans, my schemes over to you. Lead me, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. That is good. That is good.